which is a joint webinar by the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and the Actuarial Society of Malaysia. And today's session will be discussing the impact of um, artificial intelligence um, in the insurance world. So uh, my name is Karen Chua and I'm the iVoice Southeast Asia representative. Uh, and I'm delighted to um, invite two uh, volunteers uh, from the iVoi GI Asia Working Party, Si Liang Lau and Adam George, who will be presenting this session today. So they will both look at the impact of AI in the insurance world and discuss the risks and the opportunities that come along with it. Um, Adam will also look at some of the case studies uh, relating to AI and we hope that this session would be as interactive as possible from the participants. Uh, so early on, um, Sylvia, who is a moderator for the, 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 the Q&A, uh, she has shown the Slido link uh, on the, in the chat group so please use this as an opportunity to type in any of the questions that you may have for the presenters and we will cover the Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. So we en envisage that the presentation would take about 60 minutes followed by Q&A. So before further ado, I'd just like to remind everyone again to please sign in your attendance um, also via the, the link provided by Sylvia in the chat group. Um, so this will mark your attendance uh, as CPD record for today's session. So before further, uh, before, um, you know, let's kick start uh, with a couple of uh, interactive questions that we would like the audience to participate and provide your thoughts. So um, Sylvia is going to showcase two questions and we would like the audience to use Zoom to uh, vote for your answers. So there are two questions on this poll. The first one, which area do you think will experience the most significant AI lead? innovation in the next five years. So we have product, distribution, underwriting, administration, and claims. And if you switch to the second question, is your company innovating? And you have three choices here. Yes, uh, we have a well-established innovation team and program. Um, some activities on a case-to-case -case basis. And lastly, it's not considered core to our business strategy. So we'll flash up the results of your votes shortly. Um, so we'll give um, you about 15 minutes or so, or so no, 15 seconds or so to, um, to kind of cast your votes. Okay, I think we are ready to flash the results on screen. So Sylvia, may I please request for the uh, results, please? So it looks like um, quite a large proportion, about over 60% thinks it's underwriting, uh, which will be experiencing the most significant AI uh, innovation. And for your company's involvement in innovation, I suppose it's, it's a mixed bag. So some by case by case activities. Um, so shall I invite Si Liang, who is one of the speakers today, to provide his uh, feedback and his observation on these two questions. Thanks, uh, Karin. And afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, these two questions actually is quite generic. Um, essentially, just want to gauge uh, where you see um, in terms of the transformation, uh, the most impact you see uh, by function in the next five years, actually. Uh, in terms of 
really, if you look at product distribution, underwriting, administration claims, they are really parts of back, middle and front office. Uh, essentially, what you can see, underwriting is definitely taking, uh, I would expect um, all function would be disrupted one way or another, whether where you see it right now in the sense of more like in terms of back office, data warehouse, uh, claims handling, um, how you want to uh, introducing some NLP in order to, to read more wordings or in terms of distribution and then more how you want to digitalize them. And the underwriting part is really becoming more uh, granular in a way, uh, introducing a lot more telematics, uh, using a lot more technology like GPS to assess uh, even claims. So in, in my view, uh, in my mind, I mean, the next five years, all functions will be disrupted. Which one will be uh, disrupted the most. It depends on which one would be least disrupted right now, I guess. I mean, I guess I agree with everyone in the sense that the underwriting at the moment is to uh, definitely not made, definitely not on the personal lines front because I can, I can see that it's actually, uh, it's already quite uh, disrupted. Um, in a way, it's quite tech led uh, on the life side, but we are on GI side at the moment we're talking about. So we see a lot more uh, happening definitely in Europe and in the US, and we see that in China, uh, in APEC uh, right now. And definitely it will have uh, more uh, I mean, forefront coming in, in the next uh, three to five years. Uh, whereas on the innovation, it is definitely uh, in between, I guess, a lot of the, I mean, definitely case by case, most companies will uh, adapt um, to look at certain uh, tech-driven uh, solutions in order to speed up the processes. A lot of this could be driven by regulations because of uh, ledgers, uh, because of, I mean, blockchain type in, in order to settle uh, payments, uh, speeding up in terms of um, from one party to another, uh, the kind of relation B2B, B2C type uh, uh, transactions. Um, and also um, I would say that uh, um, I'm, I'm actually quite uh, surprised to see uh, still quite a, a number uh, not considered at all core to the business strategy. I'm not sure whether it's to do with the regions, but ultimately, I guess it is important to start thinking um, out, outside the box in a way of uh, innovating the, some of the processes because ultimately uh, you need to be very efficient. This, all this will actually help save costs as well as enhance uh, how, how we run the business and essentially the business model is, uh, is evolving as well. And then hence uh, the, the middle, middle part would be important. But then I guess ultimately the dedicated one would, would be definitely more ahead in the sense of um, having a new solution to, to test out in order to, to innovate. Yep, that's my opinion. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, C. So let's move on to um, the exciting part today, which is your presentation. So um, shall we just uh, just flash up the, the presentation slides on screen, please? Thank you. I'll do that. So over to you, C. Thank you. Uh, so um, thank you for having us, ASM and IFOA. Um, let me just share my screen. I'm struggling. Yeah. Yep, um, everyone can see the screen. This is just the, uh, okay, yeah. Um, so as we all aware, um, our day-to-day -day nowadays, uh, our human life and society uh, as a whole are all undergoing a deep uh, transformation. I mean, definitely, I mean, we see in the US, in China, in Europe, definitely in Singapore, I mean, Malaysia, and, and definitely Hong Kong, uh, a lot of startups we, we see day-to-day, -day, I mean, coming out, I mean, uh, nowhere like two years ago now becoming um, quite disruptive in a way, the way they're introducing a new way to, to run, to, 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 to do business, to distribute a product and even coming out with new products. Um, and especially definitely on the life and health and now we are seeing them on the GI side as well. A lot is mainly a lot driven by the accelerating impact of new technologies and entering into our daily life actually, especially with artificial intelligence and actually machine learning uh, being at the forefront of these transformations. Um, yeah, because of the dependency on the data and also the connectivity, uh, the risk landscape is actually rapidly evolving. Protection needs are changing uh, as 
are all the all all as as are the ways and means uh, to access uh, purchase and distribute products and services. So this transition will lead to certain business models and lines of business becoming less relevant and others obsolete. At the same time, um, I think it will offer opportunities for new business models and definitely new products as well. So, so at this juncture, that's why we wanted to look at the challenges. Um, this actually opposed to the industry, reinsurance and insurance as a whole, and how we need to adapt and how we need to bring to the market the innovative solution in order to, to be still here maybe in 10, 20 years time as, as the current uh, the, the sector we are in. Um, so you will see in the next slide that the agenda, um, so we actually touch on the overview. So I'm going to touch on the opportunities as well, uh, driven by AI and AI-led uh, technologies. And, and then uh, Adam will touch on the risks and challenges and also on the pricing front as well, due, uh, led by AI, uh, the challenges uh, due to AI. And so we know that um, with the strong advances in technology, the algorithms and infrastructure, these have accelerated the development of intelligent machines uh, with the latest technological improvements and this is actually becoming a daily reality and we have better sensors uh, with digital infrastructure and that support hyper connectivity with big data um, strong algorithms they're all enabling uh, artificial intelligence machine learning features all this new technology leading to the arrival of increasingly powerful and with the so-called autonomous uh, machines so the question now is um, Sorry, what what is uh, artificial intelligence? Essentially, I think we all I mean know that um, as an actress, um, it is a scientific field within the computer science, uh, focusing on the study uh, of um, the human um, um, uh, intelligence. Really, I mean, in order to solve uh, perform tasks and solve problems, um, then you have machine learning. Um, machine learning essentially is uh, is within the AI um, that actually focuses on a particular class of algorithms uh, that can learn from the data and without being explicitly uh, programmed. So you can see you have supervised machine learning. Uh, the outcome would be with the map input in, into the map outputs in a way. And then you have the unsupervised machine learning uh, that finding patterns uh, to unlabeled type input data. And then you have uh, in order virtually really to perform uh, actions in order to maximize so um, so-called um, uh, rewards yeah and 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 then that's where you have um, intelligent machine and essentially these two features uh, will give us uh, the ultimate autonomous machine to help us to analyze and to react to information about the surroundings, like sensors that we do have today, and, and, the, and then it man it's self-managed over time uh, with no human interventions, and ultimately it makes decisions for us. So this actually brings a lot more in terms of new possibilities. Um, it will affect our behavior as well, and it will transform definitely the insurance and reinsurance business in many, many ways. Um, you know, I mean, we all talk about self-driving cars, we talk about drones, and all these intelligent machines will take their place in a wider range um, over time, actually. And we're talking about other lines of business as well, such as definitely marine, uh, aviation, mining, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, as well as healthcare. Yeah. And so, so what this would do is really, it will definitely change the insurance risk profiles and the business models and it will also create some sort of new terrorists and essentially um, it will actually create a more like a type of accumulation uh, essentially because of the reliance of the technology and becoming a single point of failure uh, quite possible uh, whereby in the day-to-day -day you see the reductions uh, in terms of um, errors because of machine and it will definitely, definitely introduce some sort of transformative trends. I mean, uh, shifting the, the, the insurance business uh, way of uh, conducting insurance business and also transforming also the legal, uh, social, economic and operational environments. And, and then you will see uh, why 
in a minute uh, because of the way that machine will help make decisions over time when the more of them out there making the decision for us then we don't know whether the decision will be a good one or will be a bad one and whether we discriminate will be non how do we ensure it's non-discriminate and what kind of due process we need transparency what kind of legal framework we need in order to adapt for all these changes okay now you can see here uh, we're all familiar with siri now i mean iphone launched in 2007 uh, we have now a lot more not just series we have different type of um, smart assistant like alexa uh, in the house and then then we have smart cars we all learn about elon musk uh, hiring asking actually to, to join uh, his uh, news insurance companies i mean coming up in the us uh, uh, tesla is a really good um, disruptor in a way it is definitely i don't know whether it's series two or three now it is uh, becoming more forefront you see more 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 and more of them on the road definitely in europe definitely in the us and you see a lot more in terms of the electricity charger i mean by uh, uh i mean by your by people by people houses or even in in in, in the stop or in the in the layover uh, during a, a, a motorway um, and then you have drones you heard about amazon and walmart are testing you know, using drones to deliver parcels in certain parts of us um, we're all familiar with facebook instagram TikTok, uh, maybe and even many many more like twitter and uh, i mean president trump in the us is very famously using twitter is essentially the, the the first news you get now from trump is definitely twitter and uh, to hear about any any uh, any any uh, feedback that uh, about people about politics about events in, uh, happening around the world or in the us um, you will actually see, hear uh, his opinion through twitter for instance and you also have the kind of spotify netflix it's all the music media streaming um online networks and then everyone's rely on google maps now or ways while you're driving um as well as now we have also because many many insurance companies actually using facial recognition uh, or also imaginary uh, recognition when they look at uh, assessing claims without being uh, looking at um, the, the, the actual um, uh, damage or actual I mean I mean claim itself I mean in person for example so all these new uh, opportunities come along definitely with machine intelligence affecting across uh, all sectors all lives really and the risk landscape you can see based on all these uh, uh, portals all these platforms are actually evolving for all the insured persons um, and insure goods and um, insurers and reinsurers so the insurance industry actually must anticipate the, the, the impact on these risk profiles and the lines of business based on all these uh, I mean, disruptions uh, to be set and to react proactively um, so furthermore so all this ai uh, around us will have um the, the line of business we're talking about here that will be affected including like ocean craft cyber definitely in in, 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 the, in the limelight and then we have medical uh, assistance public uh, liability type transportation motor uh, and then um, basically all the regulations and library regime will be will be shifting uh, on the basis of the changes in the, the claims and frequency and the severity and also the impact on the social acceptance and the ethics uh, due to uh, the use of uh, AI and I mean these are just a few examples I just want to name a few more like I mean essentially if you look at Netflix it's just like movie companies without the cinemas uh, you look at uh, other example where Uber and Lyft like taxi companies without taxis really they don't own any taxis and you have AA, Airbnb essentially accommodation providers but without any hotels it's, well, as an example so all these business models has been changing really just becoming from the traditional like more like just in case ownership to definitely the sharing economy that we know of like at the moment uh, becoming more like just in time rental uh, using in machines uh, that are intelligent and what we can see here is in the sense of in the shift in the sense of the shift in the insurance needs definitely uh, from physical damage insurance uh, to ensure that service provider of such services using ai led uh, tech uh, and then more uh, also business interruption 
um, and also the IT risk. Okay. Um, so then the next bit is where can AI fit into the insurance ecosystem? So we touched on those and now these are the examples, uh, the functions that we talked about just now in the beginning, the product side, more on the, the innovation and the distribution side, uh, and then the underwriting, the administration side and the claim side. So we, we focus back on our insurance sector and you can see we know that product uh, a lot more telematic insurance now. We're talking about cyber insurance now. Uh, it's definitely becoming more and more standalone, more and more mainstream. Uh, it is the people are describing uh, cyber insurance like today, uh, maybe product insurance, uh, property insurance 50 years ago when we were still in development, uh, it's still shaping up, becoming like one of those mainstream standardized product. And you only can see this uh, coming five, 10, maybe even. Uh, maybe even five, definitely five, 10 years down the line because everything will be connected. Um, there will be a IT element, a cyber element of risk. Um, I mean, however we do things, whether we drive a car, whether we, a house we live in, it will all be connected. And what it does though with this uh, AI led technology in the sense of it increased the efficiency, it helps cross sell, it helps also in terms of upselling. Uh, yep, let me see. Um, so with all these analytics, uh, it will actually help in, I mean, understanding more, I mean, consumers behavior, it will help, um, in order to, for an insurance company to understand better, um, the need of, uh, individual co customer, it becoming very centric, very tailored, uh, is possible. And it will actually, uh, using the tech led, uh, 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 machine to help recommend the kind of, um, protection maybe uh, particular individual needs, for instance. And on the distribution side, um, we know that um, it is changing in the sense that we all becoming more digitalized and we have multi uh, uh, devices, mobile, mo mobile devices, uh, multi-channel marketing. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then you actually can uh, access um, all this uh, marketing. I mean, a lot of the time the insurers are able to actually buy some new data and use the new data to access in order to 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 understand better the behavior of uh, the, 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 the the customer or the potential news customer they have and I, I can say that you, I mean nowadays I think definitely more than uh, 50 to 80 percent uh, of the insurers are shifting to digital channel uh, to voice and digital and uh, even with I mean in, I think within this COVID-19, uh, 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 I, mean, I mean, background, I mean, uh, back, I mean, it will just actually escalate in the sense of the need of digitalization. And basically the, all this distribution will only enhance um, uh, in terms of the, 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 the because of the, the, the reliance on, uh, le less reliance on, on um, it's more, on, on the devices, on how quickly it gets to the customer. It does reduce the cost of, um, I mean, in terms of uh, per customer, it will reduce significantly. I mean, surveys recently suggest it's actually about one third of the cost has, has reduced, has been reduced as a result of this the digitalization. In terms of underwriting, um, the right underwriting can become um, more real time. Uh, also pricing, you get so many more data points and you're able to assess more quickly um, whether, I mean, definitely, it's, it's definitely in terms of telematics, you are able to assess a driver behavior better. Uh, you can actually adjust your premium quicker and you can actually decide to warn a particular driver. I mean, as, uh, as when there's a warning system, actually, I mean, being uh, picked up as to there's a change in, in terms of driving behavior, for instance, and how you want to maybe encourage that driver to behave better by giving more kind of like encouragement by giving some more, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe discount in the premium or more, I mean, kind of like scoring in order to help uh, the, 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 the driver to, to reduce premium during the renewal, for instance. Um, and also in terms of um, also underwriting because of the, the way that we, you can real time underwrite, you actually can actually do that quickly and you can reduce the, the time to introduce a new policy uh, to underwrite a new policy from let's say the average three days uh, to 30 minutes, for instance. Um, and then because of the, the variable devices we wear on the day to day, it's actually can actually really help uh, in the sense of stopping as well when um, 
any human involvement in, in, in many, many, many uh, tasks, for instance. In terms of administration, no doubt, um, everything is becoming so uh, automated. Blockchain, for instance, can help easing uh, taking payment quite inst instantly. And, and also, I mean, you can straight away tell um, uh, on the finance side how, how the automation can help reduce maybe like, let's say the credit controlling workload. Uh, there will be less errors. In fact, if there is a claim that it will be zero errors, for instance, as a result uh, of the automation, and there will be a reduction in the cost of finance. Um, there, there, there's some, some even claim it can be as high as 50%. And you're talking about human costs, I mean, human resources, the reductions in the, 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 the need of personnel can be as high as 90%, for instance. And the claims is one of those that is the most apparent that it will help reduce the frequency of claims. Uh, you will uh, be able to assess claims more accurately. Uh, it will actually is essentially maybe stop uh, from uh, the, the, the value of the claims uh, to go up. Uh, essentially, the average claim cost can come down quickly and the number of claims can go down as well. Essentially, it would be good. Um, for, for, for the insurers, but at the same time, the, the knock-on would be, uh, would also reduce premium accordingly for, for the consumers. Um, and, and then with the te technology, you can actually help detect uh, fraud as well more uh, easily, I mean. So the, 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 the one good example that I, I guess we all can uh, agree to, I mean, I don't know whether uh, it is definitely lemonade that is in the spotlight uh, recently, a uh, couple of weeks ago, when he was uh, uh, having his uh, first IPO. Um, so uh, the, the Lemonade is a US uh, company essentially founded in 2015 by two Israeli entrepreneurs, Daniel Schreiber and Shai Winning. I think that's how they we pronounce the name. And it is a startup that uh, is already positioned itself uh, as a disruptor. And it has a low slogan uh, asking uh, everyone just to forget everything you know about insurance. Uh, this, uh, there's a constant marketing drumbeat uh, to emphasize this different approach and how different it is, and then to appeal and is a, a focus on appealing to millennials. Um, so the, this recent IPO race, I think close to, uh, with the first day of the market value close to 4 billion USD. And you will see uh, what they are offering based on this five function is no, they are just a typical pets products, actually the, the one they launching recently and the homeowners product as well as renters. And they're actually still based currently in the US, in many states in the US. Um, the, the, the attractiveness about it is um, it's very transparent. And um, they actually, they know uh, how much they charge. I mean, they, they have a, they, they, they actually quite clear in terms of how much they charge the, the consumers. They actually um, uh, set aside, I mean, some flat fees, uh, about 20% maybe on the operation expenses, 20% on reinsurance, all allocating 20% for capital and 40% for claims and, and charity. And so basically they're treat, treating the, the rest of the money um, uh, as, the, as part of the consumers. Um, they use this to pay claims and they, they, they do, they, they, they allocate at whatever level where that is not within the port, uh, that is not used uh, to, 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 to the non-profit charity of the, of the, the, the uh, customer's uh, choice. And this actually creates some sort, some sort of win-win no, uh, situation, which is also a uh, trust uh, they, they actually try to build uh, within, uh, for, for the consumers. And in terms of the distribution, you can see it's online only, and, and there's only, it, it takes 90 seconds and asking just as simple as like two questions. Uh, they use the, 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 the app to, 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 ident to do the identity checks. And in fact, uh, they have a, a, a chatbot uh, called Maya uh, to formulate uh, the, the, the plan for, for, for the customer. And on the underwriting side, they, they actually, they're only asking two questions, but apparently they, they have um, more than 100 data points uh, used for underwriting. And uh, they claim they have advantage on the data and they don't, they don't use no human underwriting in more uh, fully automated, for instance. Um, and there's no fees for changes as well. When it comes to administration, when it comes to endorsement, and there's no paperwork, zero paperwork. And so, and then apparently when it comes to setting claims, it takes three minutes. This is incredible. I, I know that it is actually definitely one of the fastest uh, ever claim settlements. 
uh, and there's actually still, I think that apparently the claim at the moment there's no about 30% of the claims are not requiring any claims handler at all. I mean, so basically no uh, human involvement. But I mean, we all also know that to date, um, uh, the performance of lemonade still uh, still not uh, on on the technical side is still not very good. I mean, you're still talking about when it first two three years, you're talking about over hundred percent loss ratio. Uh, as recent as last year, I think the loss ratio has gone down to about eighty to ninety percent, and that is still considered a good improvement. I guess it's a lot to do with the fact that they claim it, it takes time to scale. Once they scale up. Uh, they had the economies of scale to to offset. Uh, I mean, to and then that's when they will become very profitable, because then we're using the tech, using the data they have. Uh, that's that that's the advantage they have. They will be able to underwrite better. That they will be able to select risk better. And okay, um, and then now we are talking about some uh, opportunities uh, led by uh, AI. So focusing on claims prevention and the management because because of the tech that we have uh, before any catastrophe, um, we know that um, we can use satellite imagery to, to help assess uh, area that are exposed to natural disasters. Um, and then actually this definitely can be used to, 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 to design uh, uh, for uh, the prevention for uh, such as uh, flood defenses, uh, it will definitely help improve the pricing process. Uh, some of the network machines can also be uh, monitored remotely using, I mean, uh, on the on this uh, areas uh, exposed to easily exposed to natural disaster. Uh, it will have real time data uh, that used to predict failures allowing firms to implement maintenance actions. Uh, also, uh, maybe even uh, uh, for if they do require part replacement, if they, they have actually monitored some, some defects in somewhere, uh, it, this all will actually prevent any unexpected downturn. And then in terms of post-catastrophe, and you know that they can use drones um, to, uh, to actually assess the, the region, they can use satellites to gather the data from the affected areas. They can draw a picture of the situation and they can actually use this information to help uh, support the emergency response. And in terms of the damage assessment, uh, the drones can be used to, to support the claims inspection and can actually to procure some kind of pro, uh, uh, photographic evidence. Uh, they will actually can identify areas which are hit badly and also can prioritize the deployment of claim adjusters to, 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 to make it really more effective in terms of loss identification. Uh, and then now we're talking about motor. We know that um, uh, it's definitely it's ripe for disruptions and, and we know uh, there are three stages, actually there are actually six stages in terms of uh, autom uh, automation of, of motor. Um, here you can see that the, the one that we are called so-called fully human is still pretty much that we see day to day on the road. I would say more than 90% still pretty much uh, some, sort, some sort of assisted uh, driving uh, 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 vehicle and also um, those fully assisted um, essentially just because um, when we talk about fully human, uh, the, um, the driver virtually need to perform all aspects of the dynamic driving tasks and there's no systems uh, to intervene. Um, so the driver has to monitor the drive 100% uh, of the time. And this is the so-called level zero to one. And to a certain extent, you might have um, some sort of um, the kind of uh, level to, let's say you're essentially you have a system that can maybe help uh, steering a bit or accelerate a bit or decelerate a bit, but the drivers do need to carry out the, 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 the driver essentially of all the other tasks, I mean, virtually in full control. And then you have the semi-autonomous that has start, you can see um, uh, the statistics saying that 93% of car accidents are due to human errors. So, and you can see uh, with the semi-autonomous or the, the so-called the level two to three uh, uh, automation. And this, then you start introducing a uh, certain system that are able to help uh, the driver to accelerate, to steer, um, but it's all defined as a use case. And 
it is actually capable to recognizing its limit and whilst you're driving. And, but the, again, the, the, the driver still uh, need to be able to monitor the drive at 100% of the time and be ready to resume control. But, but what you can see here, essentially this has already started uh, reducing in the sense of uh, uh, the, the, the number of uh, uh, accidents on the road. I mean, without the autopilot, we are talking about 1.92 million miles per accident uh, with the autopilot that would increase the miles by like almost, I would say, uh, nearly twofold, uh, to, I mean, close to twofold, 3.34 million. Um, then we have the, the infamous uh, fully autonomous that, I mean, Google is definitely a good example. Um, when it comes to the level four to five automation, this is what we so-called fully autonomous. Um, essentially, actually the driver should no longer be required at all. And we know that uh, they are being tested in many places. A lot of the, the places in the US, um, maybe in Sweden, uh, some, some places in Singapore, UK. Um, um, however, um, these are still very much at the early stage, but um, clearly a lot of this because of it's a motor. Um, so we need actually clear uh, legal framework. Uh, in order to 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 drive the, the acceptance of this and also the the penetration of this kind of new technology, so uh, unl unless the issues of the liability and guilt uh, is defined by law uh, clearly, then I mean it, it will actually will take then it will actually transform this uh, motor interest industry um, quite um, significantly, and then we have the aviation. You can see. Uh, this is definitely a, a good example, uh, definitely on the aviation side. Um, what we have, you can see um, aviation uh, is actually uh, is actually quite early, early on. I think over the past 20 years, you can see on the graph here, it uh, has been uh, progressively introducing quite a lot of innovative safety kind of like technologies and processes in order to help reduce passenger kind of like fertility and uh, fatality rates. Um, you can see the fatality rates has actually reduced uh, actually five to 10% a year. Um, and this, this, is, uh, the, this is the chart essentially just uh, telling us um, the TCAS is the Traffic Collision Avoidance um, uh, System. Um, this are lower fertility rates in fatality rates in aviation due to the safety improvements. Um, however, um, I mean, I mean, with this lower uh, the lower risk of human errors uh, means that the frequency of claims is definitely reduced. But whatever, however, the, 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 tail, the, the tail may become more uh, of a challenge. Um, this is where we, we come to in the, in the next slide. Uh, you can see in the recent years, uh, not recent year, actually last year uh, with, the, with the Boeing Max, um, we have uh, two, fata, two crashes uh, in 2019. Uh, the one, uh, one in, uh, near Indonesia uh, due to Lion Air and one is Ethiopian Airlines. They are both having this uh, so-called uh, MCAS uh, issue, um, which um, is being attributed 100% uh, to do with that, uh, but which is designed really, um, it's meant to be an automated safety feature designed uh, in the, the 737 MAX uh, to prevent the plane from actually int entering into a store. But what it, it happened is um, uh, because of this, um, I mean, I would so call that's where the, the, the accumulation, accumulation can come from this sort of massive loss events uh, due to this sort of single point of failure um, because of the breakdown, the, 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 the design, uh, the issue with the, the technology. Hence, um, it will achieve. So this is where you see the downside of the, the, the technology is the reliance on the systemic technology that create uh, the kind of new form of uh, accumulations. Um, and then essentially this, the message here is the, the, the reliance of the machine, uh, autonomous machine. There's a high dependence on the, the, the data service providers. And, and then um, that single point of failure, yeah, could bring a whole operation to a halt. This is really just a, a good example. And 
yeah, an identical dysfunction programming mistake or an inadequate software update uh, in mass products, machine like this could generate simultaneous and repeated deficiency. And this already, it took two crashes, for example, to identify the issue, the defect uh, due to this MCAS, for example. Uh, then we can go on, there's more example here. And you can see this is another one uh, uh, using neural networks. Um, again, the, 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 the machine can actually recommend some something uh, totally incorrect from Panda to Gibbon when you go through some sort of, uh, this will create a different type of um, accumulation, uh, essentially um, uh, uh, claims. And then the same with the AI, uh, um, when it comes to assessing the motor, this actually definitely will reduce claim, but in terms of detections, um, so on. I mean, essentially what it has done is shifting the, 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 the risk profile in the insurance uh, to, uh, to, to somewhere that we, we as an insurance uh, need to really pay more attention on. So I'll, I'll pass it now to Adam uh, on, on the pricing um, so that, um, yeah, so that I, Adam can take over. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lee. Um, let me just share my screen. Did you stop sharing, see already? Yes, I have, yep. Okay. Okay, um, I hope everyone can see okay. Uh, if you can't, just uh, unmute yourself and, and tell me. Um, thank you very much for joining this afternoon. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take over um, from where from what C was talking about. And firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities in pricing um, that arise from, from AI. Um, and then I'll move on to talking a little bit more about the challenges and some of the risks that we might face as we use AI more within the world of insurance. Um, I think it's important we get a sort of rounded view of it um, to make sure we kind of look at you know, the benefits as well as the risks. Um, so starting with the pricing side, um, so you know, I think when we're talking about pricing, obviously one of the key potential benefits is, is more accurate pricing. Um, you know, GLMs probably were the, the norm in the industry, at least in personal lines pricing um, for a number of years now. But certainly in, in some markets, in the more developed markets where there's more data and there's more uh, data science capabilities, machine learning is becoming increasingly common um, and increasingly widely adopted. Um, so, you know, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, machine learning methods don't have the linearity constraint that GLMs and similar methods do. And therefore, they're basically better at uncovering correlations that these other methods can't detect and more complicated patterns and connections. And you know, it's been shown um, quite extensively in, in academia that you know, these methods do lead to, to, great, to greater accuracy compared to some of the more traditional actuarial pricing methods that have been used. Um, and I think you know, whether or not it's in the early stage of adoption probably depends on the market, um, but I think they're becoming more and more common, definitely within the personal lines world, um, but also beyond that as well. So the, the picture that you can see on your screen um, is, is from an organization called Quest Marine. Um, and they are applying AI machine learning techniques within marine pricing. Uh, so marine, you know, quite a, obviously one of the longest standing forms of insurance and used quite traditional methods, I would say, for a while to price it. But what, can, what Quest Marine are trying to do is they're saying, Look, there's a lot of data points out there now. Um, a lot of ships have quite sophisticated sensors tracking their movements. Um, there's lots of information about the type of cargo that's being stored, um, the conditions it's being stored in, temperature, etc. Where you know where it might be um, dropped off or or, or, the, or the, the voyages it's going on. Um, so they're saying let's use a lot of this data along with some of these more advanced techniques and use it to come up with more sophisticated marine pricing as well as portfolio segmentation um, you know, analyses. So I think 
that's to give an example of how AI is entering the world of commercial lines pricing as well as um, personal line. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's remit will expand over time. Um, so, you know, another um, area where there's an opportunity within pricing is, is just to improve speed and efficiency. Uh, I think already within the insurance world, there's been you know, great improvements in this area over the last probably 10, 15 years. Um, but, you know, as you, as you use more sophisticated methods, making use of artificial intelligence, um, the pricing can be adapting in real time. Uh, you know, there can be less need for, for, human, um, for human work in terms of the actual calculations themselves and much more involvement from employees on interpretation and communication results. Um, and you can also, you know, come up with more innovative products where you might have pay-as-you-go policies rather than just paying an annual premium up front. You know, you could be paying um, every time you use your car potentially or, you know, just based on the usage of whatever item it is that you want to be insured, uh, as well as getting quotes, you know, more quickly or instantaneously. That's already commonplace, of course, in, in certain lines of business in certain markets, but I think that will become, you know, it will, it will keep improving. Um, but definitely, you know, some clear opportunities on, on the pricing side. So I'll move now to talk about the risks and challenges. Um, so far, we've very much focused on the benefits of AI, and I think it's clear there are a lot of those. But I think it's easy um, being in within the insurance industry to just talk about the benefits and just talk about how everyone needs to get involved with AI and it's going to do so many great things for the insurance world. And if you don't jump on board, um, you're going to be left behind. But I think as well as, you know, bearing the many opportunities in mind, we also have to be cognizant of some of the risks that can be associated with these techniques, as well as the challenges that we face. Um, so to start with, uh, still, still talking about pricing. Um, I mean, this is more about, I guess, the nature of the, the risks that we are insuring now. Um, so C touched on this a fair bit in, in his part of the presentation, but you know, the risks that we insure as, as insurers, they're changing at a much faster pace than before. Uh, the greater prevalence of AI is leading to more technological change. And it probably means that you know, the, the appropriateness of pricing based on historical experience, um, you know, that might be called into question in some instances. And perhaps the, you know, the, the, how far we go back in time, that needs to be reconsidered. Um, perhaps what happened 10 years ago, um, with, even within your portfolio, might not be that relevant for risks you're pricing today. Um, so we, we need to be cognizant of, of how risks are changing at a faster pace. And also just the complexity. You know, there's much more interconnectivity now. Uh, if you were providing machinery breakdown cover for a factory before, you probably think other than um, you know, weather risks and those type of risks, which are obviously natural um, risks, there shouldn't be that much connectivity between you know, the machine you're insuring failing and a machine um, in another factory halfway across the world. But now when a lot of these machines are reliant on the same software, there's clearly systemic risks. And whether these are covered by explicit you know, affirmative cyber insurance products or they remain as sort of silent risks. Um, these are things that we have to we have to be aware of and be conscious of the fact that you know our the risks we're insuring are, are changing quickly and becoming in some ways um, more complex and, and more difficult to assess. So I'm now going to move on to talking about some ethical considerations. Um, so there's a lot of questions uh, within these slides. Um, I guess, you know, we're talking about an ethical topic, um, a lot of overlap with philosophical considerations and phil philosophers like to ask questions. Coming up with answers is, is more of a challenge. Um, I've tried to kind of, you know, outline some of the main questions and considerations we need to take into account, but I don't think there are necessarily clear answers to these at the moment. It's really kind of just to, I suppose, raise some awareness, um, maybe act as a bit of a devil's advocate and be very interested to hear um, the thoughts of the audience about, about these issues. Start with the topic of black box algorithms, which is all about um, you know, how, how transparent do we want the, 
the processes that we're using involving AI to be. So in areas like pricing and claims, we've already talked about how AI can be used. Um, but when we're using these kind of AI machine learning techniques, compared to some of the more traditional techniques, you can, you can, get, um, you can get models which are much harder to dig into and to explain. So, you know, we have, we have questions about how important is it for people to be able to understand where their premium comes from. Um, so that, that's you know, one question is about policyholders, but then within a business, how important is it for the, for the underwriters to understand the pricing? How important is it for the management, for people at the C-suite level? Um, as these methods get more complex, there's, there's questions about, you know, whether the explainability is still there. Um, I mentioned predictive analytics and claims. I think this is an area that's that's quite contentious so we, we've talked about it in pricing but when you're using predictive analytics techniques to try and predict whether a certain claimant might be fraudulent or not um is there's questions about whether or not these are appropriate uh you know there are some insurers that are using voice analytics software so when someone rings in to submit a claim you know the the software will be listening to their voice and will be forming a judgment based upon whether or not they think they're withholding or you know manipulating some information in a way that might be fraudulent um, and this technology is obviously not 100 percent reliable and you can see how you know it might it might look um it might look quite quite bad to the general public they find out about these sort of techniques so i think you know certainly within claims there's there's a lot of questions there um, and then moving on to the limits that should be placed on use of data in general so you know um, AI and machine learning techniques are inextricably interlinked with bigger data sets and, and wider data sets. But as there's more data that becomes available, um, there's, there needs to be a debate about which sources are acceptable. So, um, you know, within health insurance, using genetic, pro genetic profile information, um, that's obviously a very controversial area. Um, insurers could use this in theory to improve the accuracy of their pricing, but do, do, do we think that's okay? for insurance companies to be using this kind of information, which is often, you know, which is outside of um, uh, uh, a consumer's control in order to adjust the price of their um, policies. Um, with motor insurance, uh, there's an example in the UK where an insurer wanted to use um, people's Facebook profiles in order to, you know, uh, adjust their, their premiums. Uh, and this immediately got a lot of pushback and they kind of withdrew this uh, attempt. Um, and another area is, is so-called claimed optimization. Um, so price optimization is, is talked about quite a lot where you raise or increase the premium based upon how likely you think your, your customer is to, to shop around. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, claimed optimization is becoming more common as well, where you use data you have um, within your database to predict how likely uh, a claimant is to accept a settlement. And if you think you can offer them a low settlement, even if it's lower than the, you know, the fair value of the claim, then you'll, you'll offer them a lower number. And effectively it will, it will lead to people who are, who are less pushy and are less likely to question um, the insurer getting lower claim settlements. So, you know, those kind of outcomes are not necessarily outcomes that, uh, people think are good for society, um, but they are kind of natural extensions of using these type of techniques um, without any caveats or any considerations as to the effect it, it might have, you know, in terms of fairness and, and these type of questions. So those are a couple of initial considerations. Um, I'll try and talk about a, a potential solution that leads to the first uh, consideration. And this is really a field of solutions rather than one solution in particular. Um, so explainable AI is, is what it's referred to as. And that covers methods and techniques um, in the application of AI such that the results can be understood by humans. So, you know, this image here, it, it, it represents turning a black box into a glass box. So really trying to unpick what's going on underneath the hood and allow it to be interpreted by by humans so there's a question really about you know do we think there's a right to explanation when you purchase an insurance policy you know do you have a right to and some understanding of where your price comes from and similarly when you make a claim um 
you know, I think most of us would agree you probably have more right to an explanation um, if your claim is being rejected as, you know, potentially fraudulent, for example. Um, but when we're using these kind of techniques, if we think there is a right to explanation, then we need to be able to, to provide that explanation in some way. Um, there's some regulations which are trying to enforce this. Um, so the GDPR regulation within the EU, um, that has a right to explanation within it, but it, it's not particularly strict, it's not legally binding, and it really kind of is it's satisfied as long as the uh, insurer can say that you know, a human is there who can explain the results of, let's say, a pricing, uh, an underwriting decision or a claims decision um, to, to someone who queries it. Um, so that's, that's the way it's kind of encoded in there, but it, it's fairly light at this point in time. Um, but yeah, I mean, the point is obviously different, different stakeholders will have different levels of interpretability that's required and they'll need different levels of detail. Um, but you know, these are important considerations that you can't be, we can't be adopting this in a widespread way without thinking about how we're going to be, you know, able to explain these techniques. So just to give a concrete example, um, so there's a question about whether or not there's a trade-off between um, the accuracy or the performance of a model and its transparency or its explainability. So the graphic on the left, you know, suggests that at the moment um, we do have something of a trade-off where as models get uh, are more accurate, they are less explainable. Um, we obviously would, would like it to be the case that that you can have both great accuracy and great explainability. And there's a lot of work being done to try and make sure that, you know, um, these machine learning models can have uh, the degree of ex explainability that they need associated with, their, with them. But at the moment, there is something of a trade-off, at least in, in certain types of models. Um, but the, the, the graph at the bottom shows one example of a method um, for explaining the output of, of a random forest in this case. Um, so this method is known as Shapley values. Um, so all, all it does basically is it, it takes lots of different combinations of variable values within your model. And by looking at the output of the model, um, it quantifies how much of an impact the different variables have. So, you know, this graphic is showing, um, it's showing one particular set of of variable values and it's showing the impact that each variable has on in this case the house price so you can see this house price of 206,000 that's being output and um, to the left you've got some some red uh, bars and these are all variables which are leading to um, an increase in the price of the house and the bigger the bar the greater the impact that that variable has so you can see the biggest is the overall quality whatever that means followed by the year in which it's built and so on and on the right hand side you have um, variables that will act to lower the, the model output in terms of the house price so the, the the square footage of the basement and so on so these are the Shapley values you know for one particular uh, set of variables but by considering um, many different combinations of values and averaging over all these different combinations you can come up with you know graphics uh, showing the impact of the different different rating factors or whatever your variables are. So this is just an example of, of one technique. There's lots of different ones around um, and it's definitely a sort of burgeoning field. Um, so mo moving on to some more considerations, some more rhetorical questions. Um, hopefully not too rhetorical, hopefully I'll, I'll try and give some answers. But the first one is um, whether or not atomized pricing is a good thing. Um, whatever that means. So atomized pricing, what I'm talking about here is pricing getting more and more granular. So as, as our techniques improve, as the size of our data sets improve, uh, we should be able to segment, um, segment uh, the risks that we're pricing into smaller and smaller buckets uh, and, and basically have you know, more, more granular prices. Um, and insurers naturally want to do this because you know, we fear adverse selection we want to make our pricing as granular as, as we can while still you know, maintaining accuracy and reliability. But you know, if, you, if, you take this, um, if you take this far enough, you end up with, with very, very small risk buckets in theory if the methods get good enough. And this is kind of somewhat in conflict with the basic principle of the sharing of risk, 
which is what where insurance comes from you know in at its very core it is a, a collective pooling of risk um you know within 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 different within different insurance companies so you know if we if we end up being able to segment people into very small buckets segment risks into very small buckets one of the effects is that you're going to get people who are very high risk or, or companies that are very high risk they're going to have very high premiums very high prices um, and sometimes you might think this is okay you know if you are if you're a driver that drives at 100 miles an hour everywhere and and is always slamming on your brakes then you probably think it's okay that they're charged a very high price until they adjust their driving um, but if it's maybe due to things like um, the location of your property you know and some people can't afford to move or or maybe your occupation which a lot of people don't have control over um, you, you want to think about whether we want this real atomization and greater skewing of, of pricing as we get more advanced techniques um, so you know maybe we think we only want to to allow this pricing to get really granular and really skewed for factors that we think are inside people's control um, but then there's questions about what is inside you know a person's control and what is what is something that they're kind of um, just you know a victim of their circumstances in some cases so you know this is i think one of the key questions that needs to be answered um, it could be that we get more pools set up um, you know government back pools to to allow people who who would only ha would have to pay very high prices to get insurance to have coverage but then you kind of think well you know ideally insurers would be providing this coverage themselves at affordable prices um, but it's it's certainly a, a tricky area and i think one that there will be a lot more focus on in the future and then there's a question of of how we prevent discrimination and bias um, within within you know machine learning models and techniques um, and this this i say this i would say is not limited to, to i guess ai and and machine learning techniques you know it is something which which can affect glms and more basic pricing methods as well but it's a very topical area it's one that there's a lot of discussion on and a lot of research on um, so i guess you know one one point is that uh, a lot of the current approaches are saying that to avoid discrimination you might need to incorporate protected characteristics into models and um, protected characteristics being those which you are not allowed to legally differentiate between different groups on the basis of so things like um, race religion uh, sexuality and within the eu at least gender um, so so you know there's a question of whether we need to start incorporating these into models in order to avoid discrimination which is somewhat can be somewhat counterintuitive but it's what a lot of the the research is suggesting um, and, and you know there's a lot of problems in defining discrimination and fairness because different people might have different ideas about it and it's, it's definitely not straightforward um, so a case study that i think you know illustrates this um, is a case that got a lot of attention um, in the us so it's to do with this uh, machine learning algorithm called compass and this was uh, devised by a company called north point and it was used uh, by the united states um, government to assess the likelihood of uh, prison defendants reoffending. So the defendants were given a score, uh, to, well, in this example, it's simplified, split into low or medium high risk categories. And this was meant to predict, you know, how likely they would, to, how likely they would be to reoffend based on a number of different factors. Now there was an expose of this, um, this algorithm in a publication called ProPublica and um, as you can see you know in the second uh, the second comment ProPublica said that this algorithm is unfair because black defendants who don't recidivate which is reoffending, um, are disproportionately predicted to be riskier than their white counterparts um, and the reason for this is that as you can see there's simply a higher proportion of, um, of black defendants are rated as medium or high risk versus white defendants um, so you know obviously there's a, a fair chunk of those who are placed in the high risk or medium risk category who, who don't reoffend, um, and you know and, and they're disproportionately black compared to compared to being white um, the makers of the algorithm north point responded that 
you know, actually it, the argument is perfectly fair because if you look at the proportion within each category, um, the proportion who reoffend is is the same regardless of race. So if you look in the, the low bar, it's it's about one third of those who are low risk who reoffend, and if you look in the medium high, it's about two thirds, and that's the same, more or less the same, whether you're black or whether you're white. So North North Point are basically saying, you know, it's equally accurate or equally inaccurate, depending on how you want to look at it, regardless of whether you're black or white. But you know, ProPublica's criticism is that um, if you if you're classed, if you're given a kind of false positive, you're classed as medium or high, and you don't reoffend, that happens disproportionately um, to black people rather than white. So, you know, I think this is a really good example of how it's not necessarily clear cut. Um, you have to actually look into things a bit to understand whether or not there is some um, bias or some unfairness, and and people don't always agree on it. Um, you know, there's a further point, I guess, even if you accept North Point's um, argument that um, because the model is equally accurate at predicting whether or not somebody will reoffend regardless of their race, um, you have a question about, okay, in, in the, the data set that it's using to come up with the model, if it is the case that there are more black people reoffending compared to white people, uh, you know, proportionately, um, why is that the case? Is it because the police themselves are disproportionately arresting black people versus white people based on racial prejudices within the police system? And this really, you know, it's all linked to the question of if there are biases within the world, do we want our models to um, reproduce those biases? Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a very topical area and one that we'll see a lot more um, discussion and, and thought in the future. And just to expand on this a bit further, so there's a picture on the right, um, which is the icon of this organization called the Algorithmic Justice League. So they're sort of channeling a, a superhero vibe, I guess. Um, and their, their aim, their stated aim is to um, basically, you know, raise awareness of the potential for bias and discrimination within algorithms, um, particularly just, you know, reproducing biases that might already exist in the real world. Um, so they, they kind of try and raise awareness on this and, and um, and promote you know this this cause as it were, um, and I'm just giving a couple of quick definitions here. There's there's other definitions, more sophisticated ones, and there's a lot of, um, of, of of stuff that you can read if you're interested in this. Um, but a basic definition might be unawareness, and what that basically says is as long as your pricing method or you know whatever the um, whatever the purpose of the algorithm you're using is, as long as it ignores the protected characteristics, such as sexuality, race, etc., cetera, um, then it's fine. So as long as, you know, if you just change the protected characteristics of your, your input data, um, you know, if you're, there's no change in the price, for example, then it's, it's fair or it's not discriminating. And this is kind of the most com common definition currently adopted um, by regulators. Um, if, if this isn't the case, you know, if I were to just change my gender, for example, in the EU, when applying for a car insurance quote, and I got a, a different price, then that, that would be seen as discriminating. Um, the key criticism of this is that it's vulnerable to indirect discrimination. So if there are correlations uh, between characteristics which aren't protected and characteristics which are protected, so for example, if there are correlations between uh, your race and your address, which there are in lots of cases, you know, you can get um, discriminatory effects coming through in an indirect manner. Um, there's a very good article in the Actuary magazine a few months ago that was giving, you know, a good explanation of, of how this can occur. And a lot, of, a lot of people are saying that, you know, it's not enough just to say, you know, just to define it as unawareness. We also need to watch out for indirect discrimination as well. Um, so another definition is demographic parity. And that says that across uh, you know, the pop, a data set or your portfolio, whatever your population is, the expected value, so whether that's the price or the likelihood of being a claim being classed as fraudulent, should be the same for different protected characteristics. So for example, you know, your, the, ex the expected value, the mean value um, of your, your car insurance premium should be the same regardless of, of whether you're Christian or Muslim, for example. Um, and that, you know, that can not be the case whilst definition one holds. 
Um, in, in fact, in order to achieve this demographic parity, um, you, you, in a lot of cases, it requires some sort of cross subsidization between different groups. Um, and it also requires data collection of the, um, the protected characteristics, which you, know, you might not be collecting at the moment. And there's a question about whether you know, we think it's okay for insurers to be collecting this data, um, you know, such as data on people's sexuality. You know, it, would, it would seem quite odd, I would think, to a member of the, the general public to, for, for insurers to be asking for this information in order to avoid discriminating against it. But even if you, you're not saying we want demographic parity, even if you're using a lot of the other definitions, um, which try to, and try to reduce bias and discrimination within models, you, a lot, most of those methods do require the, the collection of these data items in order to adjust, um, adjust you know, to avoid these, these unwanted effects. Um, so you know, the article in the Actuary magazine, it talks about averaging out the discriminatory characteristics or the protected characteristics across the population. Uh, so if, if the protected characteristic you're worried about is gender, and within your data set, um, there's a very uh, high proportion of, of younger people who are, are female, but you've got a much higher proportion of, um, of males within the older, the older, the older age group. Um, it kind of averages out um, the, the gender splits across the age groups in order to, to remove the indirect discriminatory effects. So those, those are the type of approaches that uh, the people are suggesting. Um, but definitely an area where there's a lot going on at the moment. And just uh, one more sort of um, expansion on this to touch on. Um, oh, sorry, skip forward. Um, so this is a possible sort of, it's actually kind of a regulatory solution in a way. It's a, it's a test that was put forward in a, an article by one of the founders of Lemonade that C mentioned earlier called Daniel Schreiber. Um, and this is his sort of suggestion for how uh, regulators or people who are you know, concerned about insurers um, using machine learning techniques or just discriminating via pricing models or, or claims models in fact. It's a suggestion of, of how you can test um, for whether discriminatory effects are coming in. So his suggestion is that an insurer is behaving in a discriminatory way if the loss ratios are not uniform across different protected groups. So you know, in that graph here, it's, it's saying that, you know, let's say the different protected classes of different religions. Um, he's suggesting that if for one religion, the loss ratio is much lower than the others, then that suggests that that religion, people within that religion are, are being you know, discriminated against by the insurer. And I guess the important thing to note here is this accepts that you might end up with different prices, for different protected groups. Um, but as long as that is um, proportional to there being different you know, claims emerging um, for those different protected groups, then that's okay. And you will see a uniform loss ratio if that is the case. Um, so his example is, you know, he's Jewish and he says, you know, that um, within the Jewish community, people tend to like candlesticks a lot more often than the average person might because there's a lot of uh, Jewish ceremonies that require candle lighting. So he says it's fine. Um, you know, if he's, if he's a Jewish person who happens to light a lot of candles, then he doesn't mind to pay a higher fire insurance premium because he's doing an activity, lighting lots of candles, which is, which is more risky. And if, if the insurer is able to pick up on that piece of information, it's okay for them to use it. However, if they just say, okay, Jewish people in general are, are a greater fire risk and they, they give all of them a, a higher charge, then that won't be okay. And it would show up ultimately in, the, in this uniform loss ratio test. Um, so the idea is, is you know, it, it should, you know, improvements in pricing techno technologies should allow us to um, become more accurate and it, it should stop, you know, differences in, in loss ratios between different protected classes. But clearly there's going to be random volatility, you know, in claims experience, as we well know. So I think there's a lot of questions about how reliable this would be as a method um, in practice. Um, but it's, it's one suggestion that, that he came up with. So just a final few slides then, Conscious we've already um, talked for quite a long time. Um, but I guess, you know, I think, I think it's important to say that actuaries are very well positioned to be involved in these kind of um, ethical discussions about the use of AI. 
Um, you know, to start with, we should be better placed to understand it than a lot of other people in other professions within the insurance industry. So we should have those technical skills that, that are required. Um, we also, obviously, we research and collaborate across companies, which is very important in, in progressing in these areas. And in theory, we're also good at communicating complex stuff in a simple, understandable way, which is going to be crucial in um, developing techniques which um, are ethical and are accepted by the public as a whole. Um, so I think it's, it's important for actuaries to get involved in these discussions and it's important to, to build them into to model governance processes where you know, discussions about what do we think is fair, um, how are we going to define, how are we going to test whether or not you know, our model is fair, um, these, these questions get asked. I think that's it's very important for actuaries to be involved in that. And just a couple of, um, of kind of tangent, well, slightly different um, issues to consider. Um, there's certainly potential for more blurring of liability, liability boundaries um, as AI becomes more prevalent within our world. So, you know, an example of a car crash, um, if it's an autonomous vehicle, there's a lot more parties that could be responsible than there were in the past. Um, obviously, the, you know, the manufacturer of the car, digital map provider, if it's something to do with the map, you could have hackers involved. So there's, there's certainly, um, definitely, I think, when, when these cars actually um, become active or in, in real world settings, there will certainly be a lot of very complicated and convoluted legal cases early on when liability is being assigned. Um, and it's going to take some time for these kind of questions to become, um, to get answered in a more standard and, and consistent way. Um, it's just an example of a piece of legislation that is in force in the UK um, to govern the uh, basically how liability gets assigned if an autonomous vehicle is involved. Um, so the key point is that the insurer would initially bear the liability where there's an accident um, with no driver control. Um, but this could reduce or disappear if um, the software wasn't updated or there were problems with it or a driver was negligent, for example. So the liability still rests with the motor insurer initially, but it could um, go to the driver if they were negligent or it, the insurer could subrogate from, um, let's say, the, the car manufacturer if there was a problem with the, the car that led to the crash. Um, so just an example of the type of framework that has been set up in one place in the world. So just to sum up then, the final slides, um, I think hopefully we've shown how AI can feed into many areas of the insurance ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, AI can certainly be a competitive advantage if it's used correctly. And it can also be something that really improves the customer experience and um, also just helps insurers contribute to society. I mean, C talked about some of the examples with claims prevention, for example. If insurers can become involved in actively preventing claims rather than just paying them out, this is certainly a good, you know, that would um, be rendered to society. Um, but having said that, as we've seen, there are a lot of issues that need to be thought about carefully and, um, and dealt with. Um, in order to make sure that um, AI is not used in a way that will ultimately lead to, to lower trust and, um, and, and, and problems for the insurance industry going forward.